Survey says. Bah, there we go. We have the technology. Right, so thanks for that, Sam. That was a fabulous introduction. Um, yeah, so I'm Paco Hope, and I work in the professional services team at AWS. I don't actually end up in this office all that often. I end up uh, down in Holborn a lot, which is where AWS folks tend to hang out. Um, and I've been doing cloud security now for about two and a half years. Uh, I've, I, before that, uh, as Sam said, I was with um, uh, Sigital. Now there's Synopsys, did penetration testing, threat modeling, that kind of thing. And so I want to talk to you about incident response and forensics in your pajamas, it's focusing on the cloud. So if I'm going to talk about the cloud, let's just make sure I have a baseline. I mean, yeah, you're, you're actually sat here in an Amazon office, but how many of you are actually using AWS? Got somebody to, that's a lot of hands. <laughs> I'm really loving it. And how about people using any cloud at all? I mean, if you're using any cloud at all, excellent, very good. Because that's great, right? The cloud is kind of the new way of doing things, and we have our particular definition, which is to say it's you know, the on-demand IT delivered over the internet, pay as you go. Uh, you will hear some people talk about private cloud, which to me is kind of a funny way of saying data center. But there's the public cloud, the whole concept of the cloud is elastic scale on demand and uh, delivered with the, the internet as your sort of service network, as your backbone in some sense. But if we're going to talk about, you know, Doing instant response in your pajamas. Well, let's let's all have a nice baseline on all these terms, right? So, what are all the what are pajamas? Right, pajamas pajamas are these things, right? They comfortable, loose fitting clothes. That was sort of imported uh, to Western Europe from uh, the 19th century. Uh, people said, "Wow, <laughs> these folks in the East, they sure were dressed comfortable. Let's just do that." You know, no more corsets. Um, the most important thing is that you generally don't dress like this in a data center. Right, So this is just not appropriate attire for a data center. And if you've done incident response, you probably have had these moments when it's like, crap, i got to go you know, get a suitcase to go fetch a bunch of hard drives from the data center. And that means getting out of your pajamas. Right? And nobody really wants to do that. So that's kind of our fundamental question. Like, If we need high quality forensics and high quality incident response, is getting dressed really the price we're just going to have to pay? And I'm here to say no. You do not have to pay that price. And it's also important to, to understand how we conceive of the shared responsibility model and how we think about security in the cloud. If you've done security in the cloud, you've seen this or some variation of this. Because security, there's a bunch of stuff that AWS does, and we just do it, and, and, and we do that for you, and you don't. There's a fair bit of stuff where you do it and we don't. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff in the middle where you do it, but you're going to do it with tools that we write and that we create. You're, the network security is your responsibility, but you're going to do that with security groups and knackles and subnets and routes and internet gateways and VPC, things that we kind of create. So there's this whole bit in the middle where we collaborate. So for those of you who may not have seen it before, right, this security of the cloud piece at the bottom, that's all the physicality of it, the physical servers and the data centers and the networking and heating and cooling and all that kind of stuff. And the bit up at the top is always the customer responsibility, right? It's always the data, the data classification, you own it, it's yours. And then there's this other stuff in the middle that's kind of fun and squishy, and it's a, it's a little bit, what operating system are we running? What uh, version of Java are we running? How's the network wired up? Who's connected to who? That kind of thing. So when we think about security in the cloud, think about security controls, right? And security controls, like how you, how you do this work, they come in about four kinds. We break it down this way. There are other ways to do it. This is the one that we use. And you got your directive security controls, which are, you know, no private, uh, no PII in a test environment, you know, or nobody from the developer team can log in in production. Or those, those are the kind of high-level directive security controls. We, we they establish the norms for what we're going to do. You got your detective controls. I'm sorry, your preventative controls. And this is where a lot of people get really hung up. We love to stop the bad things from happening. Can't go there, can't connect that, can't do this, can't 
decrypt that, can't get this key, can't read that data. They're important, right? They're the bedrock. Most of our security work is done there. Detective controls are all these like logs and, and audit capabilities and events that we are aware of, the things that are showing us what's happening in our environment. And then finally, the responsive bit, which is, you know, something bad happened or something interesting is going on, we need to go have a look. <coughs> so for the rest of this talk, I'm really going to focus on those, those bottom two, right? The detective and responsive pieces. How do we spot bad things happening in the environment? How do we respond? And most importantly, how do we stay in our pajamas while doing it? So what sort of incidents might we run into in the cloud? I'm going to sort of do these um, in kind of gentlest to, to most urgent, right? We have some basic stuff like compliance variants. You might have a company policy that says, you know what, all EC2 instances need to have encrypted EBS volumes. You know, always encrypt the EBS volumes. So if you spot uh, an instance that doesn't have an encrypted EBS volume, it might not be like a big problem, right? There might not be any data there. Nobody's compromised anything. But you're not compliant with policy. And so, you know, we're going to deal with that as an incident. We actually have a team of guys. If you're familiar with Chaos Monkey, right, uh, the, the, the Netflix thing that goes around knocking stuff down that's supposed to be up, teaches you how to you know, keep things resilient. We actually had a guy write the inverse for a customer, which is standing stuff up that's not supposed to be there. Right? And it was getting the, the security team to sort of be responding to this kind of event more regularly and in a more automated fashion. You know, create a security group that's open to the world. It's not attached to anything, right? There's no traffic flowing in or out. But go ahead and create it, because then the, the team's like, what's that doing there? Somebody go get rid of that. You know, an, incident, uh, an EC2 instance that stands up with an unencrypted hard drive. Well, terminate that. Service disruption, right? So if there's either, you know, someone has uh, botched the security group so you can't connect to things you're supposed to, or there's some kind of availability zone issue, you know, those are incidents that we might have to respond to from a security perspective. You don't always think of performance as strictly performance. Sometimes it's a security issue. Or, you know, unauthorized resources. Have you got, you know, a, a database standing up in production? You're like, what is that doing over there? Why is that in there? And you start to see how some of these are getting a little more interesting, like we should probably respond a little faster. Unauthorized access. When you think about the cloud, you have two kinds of unauthorized access. Right? There's unauthorized access to a resource, like somebody logged in on a Windows box or logged in on a Linux box and they're not supposed to. Or somebody is actively working in your application who's not supposed to have access. But then there's also at the cloud level itself, unauthorized access, logging in on the console, or you know, doing th being able to see things in your environment. Now we start to get to the real interesting ones, privilege escalation. Again, when you think about it, you being not us, uh, you could be thinking about privilege escalation inside Linux, inside Windows, inside the web app or, or some other program. Or it could be privilege escalation in the cloud itself, attaching a role or assuming a role with higher privileges. Excessive permissions. I call this one the Steve problem, because I was discussing this at a customer one time, and I started talking about, you know, one of the things you might want to look out for is excessive permissions. And seriously, like four people at the table just said, Steve. Just look at, so ever since, I've just called this the Steve problem. Because there's Steve on everybody's team, right? You always got that one person who's just got entirely too many privileges. Information exposure. This is starting to get really you know, exciting, right? These are the, like the S3 buckets that have data in them that shouldn't have data in them. Or they are um, you know, ports open to the world that shouldn't be open to the world. I've had customers who stand up a squid proxy. Um, they need to do that for some reason, maybe for testing, and it's accidentally open to the world and is accidentally relaying um, to wherever from wherever. And that stuff gets found. That stuff gets found really quickly. Um, interestingly enough, they discovered that through guard duty, which is one of our services that kind of monitors network traffic in your VPC. And they're like, you've got an instance that's talking to some really weird places on the internet. Why is it doing that? And they took a look. Oh, it's an open proxy. That's why it's doing that. 
And then the credential exposure, right? This is kind of the worst one, right? When somebody commits some, some access keys to GitHub or you know, puts passwords.txt into Google Docs or whatever. Um, these sorts of things happen, and that's definitely going to precipitate a security incident, something we have to jump in and respond to. Now, you, again, as a customer, you have two domains that you want to think about. And I promise we're going to get to the pajamas bit. I really, you know, it's, I, I didn't do this for fun. We're really going to get there. But, like, you've got to think about your infrastructure incidents, right? You have this infrastructure domain, and these are things where you're going to know the tools that you might use to do incident response here. You know your operating system level tools. You know the, the, the network level tools that you might use, say, VPC flow logs for looking at traffic, or even your on, on instant stuff like firewalls and things. Um, it, these are incidents where you, you've got the tools. You know what to do. You've done this before. There's a lot of things very similar to these incidents uh, in the cloud. They're very similar to what you do uh, on premises. But I think what you're going to see is that in the cloud, you end up with a few more tools that make some of these a lot easier. And then there's what I call the service domain of incidents. These are the ones where everything involved is more of like an abstract resource in the cloud. So the way you're going to have to deal with it is going to be fundamentally cloud native all the time. So if you have like an IAM issue in terms of roles or privileges or users, you're going to use IAM or CloudTrail or CloudWatch logs or, or something cloud native to address that incident. There's not going to be a hard drive to go image. There's not going to be a, a network packet capture that's, that's going to help you. Uh, S3 buckets. Again, you know, if you had S3 logs, access logs turned on, you're going to know what happened. If you didn't have S3 access logs turned on, you're not going to know what happened. And there isn't going to be a, a hard drive that you can go image to figure out what happened. And so forth. Billing, other services in the cloud. Uh, I'll get to the billing thing. You want to talk about a great indicator of compromise? Billing, your billing uh, API is a great indicator that something is not right. And that's really important, right? Where do you get some information? You've got the logging and the monitoring that you have installed on your instances or cloud trail in the actual cloud. You've got billing activity. This is an important indicator of compromise. And there's a bunch of really obvious heuristics you could probably just turn on, especially in your personal accounts. I know a lot of you will have personal accounts. If billing in Singapore is non-zero, you know, what's going on? How about an alert for that one? Billing in Toronto is non-zero. Like, I, I don't know about you, but I only personally use one region, right? Everything for me is in, in Ireland. So, you know, if you see greater than zero billing almost anywhere in the world, that's probably something to look at. Um, and then, you know, for customers who are like, oh, you've done $20,000 in the last hour, also something to look at. Threat intelligence. Many of you, as an, uh, many enterprises, get some kind of a threat intelligence feed, right? So they're getting it from one of the major threat intel providers. There's also guard duty, which is a service that we use to surface threat intelligence to you. Um, these things are really important indicators of compromise. We know these bad guys are doing bad stuff over there. We see those same bad guys talking to us over here. Let's go have a look at that. AWS outreach. If you're working with us, and even if you work with any other cloud provider, right, sometimes they're the ones who notice problems first. Right? Somebody breaks into your instance and starts using it to attack outbound, we might be the first ones to notice that. And so sometimes we're going to be the ones picking up the phone, calling up and saying, hey, uh, there's some weird stuff happening there. Do you want to just let us know if that's normal? And we've had a couple of customers where we did this, where um, you know, we saw some bad stuff happening. And, and so what do we do? Standard procedure. Pick up the phone, call the number that's on file, send an email to the email address on file, and the phone number goes nowhere that doesn't actually ring on anybody, uh, anybody's phone, and the email goes to accounts payable because generally they're the ones who end up having to deal with all the AWS stuff. And the accounts payable is looking at this security incident going, you understand that? I don't understand that either. It's like a day later they send it to the tech guys. Hey guys, we got this weird email from AWS. Um, something about denial of service. We're not going to cut the servers off, are they? Ah! You know, and so... Um, 
make sure from a you know AWS account perspective, make sure that those phone numbers ring on somebody who knows what to do if we call, and make sure that the email goes to a distribution list that includes people who know what to do if we if we send email. Um, and you know you got to really keep that stuff up to date because sometimes your cloud providers can be the first one to, to see something and tell you. And finally, there's this other source of information. I, I say here, ad hoc content. But I'm going to tell you how we do it here within AWS, and I would urge you to, to have the same attitude within, uh, within your own organizations. Uh, the easy way to say it is a friendly front door. Our guys at AWS Security have just pushed this thing, pushed this message to the rest of the business, that if you aren't sure if it's a high-priority security ticket, mark it high-priority anyways. Send it to the team high-priority anyways. They would much rather get that thing and say, oh, no, that's not high-priority. We'll just, you know, we'll take care of that at a low-priority. Much rather do that than to find out that, well, you saw this thing that we should have told people about, but you weren't sure, you didn't want to waste somebody's time, you didn't want to feel foolish because it wasn't important. You know, we, we don't want, we always want a happy front door to security. And they will never give you a hard time about sending them a high priority message saying, we think this is a problem. They will always thank you for doing that. So also with you from your own security incident response teams, make sure your front door is friendly. Make sure that everybody who sends the ticket in is thanked and, and just Deprioritize if it isn't really important. And then within the cloud, you're always going to have programmatic sources of info, right? So we got CloudWatch logs, which lets you see all the logs off your servers. We got CloudWatch events, which are like kind of event driven. So you don't have to poll things, you don't have to sit and kind of watch stuff happen. We'll let you know if something happens. You have alarms. Alarms can be set for performance. Alarms can be set for you know, uh, latency and a lot of other things that you can measure. And then VPC flow logs, guard duty Macy, a bunch of different ways to sort of watch what's going on in the cloud and then make decisions and respond. And then CloudTrail, which monitors all the API level access every time you start an instance, stop an instance, spin something up, shut something down. So let's imagine that one of these things has happened, right? Somehow, somewhere, somebody let us know a bad thing's happening. I want to walk you through what incident response in the cloud looks like. And this is kind of fun stuff, and, and I'm going to show you a bunch of open source tools at the end, too, that will help you out. So let's say we got this EC2 instance, right? Here's our happy working AWS cluster. Like, you've seen these things before. If you haven't seen AWS standard stuff, this is, you know, Internet Gateway, Load Balancer, Auto Scaling Group. Today we have three instances in there. And uh-oh, something's gone wrong. Now let's not worry about what it is or how we figured it out. You know, maybe somebody's SSH'd in and they've run sudo and there's nobody supposed to do that. Or you know, maybe we're seeing malicious outbound traffic. We don't know. What we do know is there's a problem and we're going to have to deal with it. So. First thing you got to do, you've detected this guy, stop it talking to customers. We don't want it dealing with anybody out there in the real world while we go figure out what went wrong. Right? So we got to figure out who is it. And you can just run an AWS EC2 command right from the command line. Hey, what instance is it that has this IP address? Okay, so go tag that guy and with our you know, incident identifier, we're going to go start dealing with that. And then we're going to actually detach it from the load balancer, and we're going to detach it from the auto scaling group. All right? So no more traffic. Nobody's going to. No new sessions are going to come through and end up talking to this bad guy. We don't know what's, what the problem is yet, but nobody knew was going to talk to it. And you got a couple of ways when you detach from the load balancer. You can do it kind of the nice way, connection draining. Let the last couple of sessions wind down and then cut it off, or you can just say. No more packets for you, and just, just cut it off. And somebody might have to log in again or lose their current work. Um, having done that, one of the things that's not shown on this picture is the way auto-scaling groups work. Right? We were supposed to have three. And the auto-scaling group's going to look at that and say, we're supposed to have three. There's only two. Let me go spin up another one. Right? And so that will just happen. 
right? So as a side effect of having done this, a third instance will come back up in, in however long that takes. And so it's actually a pretty easy way to, to manage an incident, right? The customer experience is going to be pretty minimal. They will continue to be serviced. Maybe things slow down a little bit while that node goes away and another one comes back up. But it's not catastrophic, which is pretty cool. So now we really, really don't want any traffic going in or out. Like, what if it was terrible? And that, there's an attacker on there who's got persistence, and they're like sending data back out. Just slap down an isolating security group. No packets in or out. Right? So at this point, it doesn't matter what they've done. There's no packets going in or out of that instance. So now we've sort of got it contained. You may have noticed that one of the things we have not done, and in fact are not going to do in this entire presentation, is terminate the instance. I cannot tell you how many times customers come to me and say, we saw something weird, we, we terminated the instance, can you tell us what happened? <laughs> well, no, I'm not a mind reader, man. I like, <laughs> you know, and, and this, like, don't, you don't have to terminate it, right? I get it. Like, you've got this thing in your environment, and you don't like it, there's something wrong with it. Isolate it and leave it around for gathering evidence. It's, it's kind of like, you know, somebody got murdered in this hotel room, the cleaners have come in and mopped everything up. Can you guys investigate who the killer was? Well, no, you just, so you get the idea. But that security group is going to come in handy in a minute, right? So again, I've got a couple of commands here. Just, hey, modify instance attribute, slap this security group on there, off we go. Now, I want to know what's going on on that instance. And, you know, the way I've sort of drawn it here is a little hinky, but whatever. It, it gives EBS volume, that's the hard drive for that instance, right? I'm going to go take a snapshot of that, of that instance, of that instance's hard drive. And importantly, EBS volumes are in a particular availability zone, right? They could go away, or things could happen because they're only in one availability zone. Snapshots get pushed out to S3, so they're now regionalized. And so any disruption in an availability zone won't affect the actual snapshot, and it has the good old 11.9's durability of, uh, of S3. So at that point, even if something goes wrong with the instance, I now have a solid snapshot and it's not going to be, nothing's going to happen to that. And against a couple of commands, just, hey, make me a snapshot, please. And that's super helpful because now I have this byte for byte copy of the media, byte for byte copy of the hard drive. I want to do some forensic analysis? I can do that, right? I can attach that I can make a copy of that and just attach it to my forensics instance. My forensics instance, of course, don't you have one just laying around ready to start up when you, when you need it? Because that's how you do this in the cloud, right? It's not like a big VM that sits around running. It's just a machine image, and when I have some forensics to do, I start one up. So I can actually attach that, a copy of that snapshot right to the instance. And... Uh, Depending on, you know, like, if I was using some sort of Windows forensics tool, this would become like the D drive or something. You know, under Linux, you can see it's, you know, dev SDF. It's just a, a secondary volume on the Linux instance. And, of course, the great thing about that is that forensics instance will deal with nothing except this incident for its entire existence, right? If, if I had another incident, I could launch another forensics instance. So you have this nice compartmentalization as well. You're not polluting. It's not like taking a hard drive from the data center and plug it into the same old forensics workstation. You know, have complete copies of everything. If I want to do some destructive tests, if I wanted to like really analyze that, that volume and maybe they're actually going to modify the file system doing these, it's fine. I can make another copy of the snapshot. I can, I can do tests that write. That would be okay. And now that security group that I put around the instance, that's actually kind of handy because I could allow access network-wise from my forensics instance without allowing access from anybody else. So now I could perhaps log in, have a look around. I could install a kernel module like Lime, um, which would let me dump the RAM of the Linux instance and start to see what's going on. And again, that's just a, an API command. Attach, allow ingress, that sort of thing. The thing is, you, you do all that, it's really cool, right? But it sure as heck sounded like work, 
right? Like I had to, I was typing commands there, and that feels like work. And I don't want to do work. So if we can think about it, uh, anything that I could type as a bunch of commands, right? I could probably knock that up into like a shell script or something. But like if I could knock it into a shell script, I could probably just make that a Python program with bot03 and just kind of do it that way. But heck, if I could do it in a Python program, I could probably just make that a Lambda function, couldn't I? And you know, if I could do it as a Lambda function, I could trigger off an event, right? So I don't have to like make the Lambda function run, an event will make the Lambda function run. And that is how you get the incident response in your pajamas fast asleep, <laughs> right? So, and then of course, if you've got like Alexa, then it's just like, you know, you just like, there's been an incident. I've started the coffee maker. Why don't you get a shower and then go check it out? You know, like, this is what incident response in the cloud ought to be, right? So you don't have to do this. In, you know, there's none of this like jump up at two in the morning and oh my God, run to the data center. So that's the, uh, that's kind of the, the kicker. That's what we're aiming for. But can you imagine having to write that yourself? I'm not going to write that myself. I'm going to show you how somebody else wrote that for me. <laughs> I, should, I suppose I, I don't really want to be logged in right now. Thank you very much. That's a bit funny. Go away. Thank you. Good. So that was the infrastructure domain, right? Now, the infrastructure domain is the stuff that kind of runs like EC2, that runs a bit the way your old data center ran. There are service domain incidents, things that are happening natively in the cloud. And so we do want to talk about those. We want to talk about what that's like and how you deal with those. So your service domain incident could be something like, we've got to change to an IAM policy. We've got to change to a bucket policy. We've got to change to some credentials. Uh, we've got, you know, attach internet gateway. That's a great example of like, you did what? You know, who attaches internet gateways very often? Right? That's one of these things that, well, yeah, you got to do it once, but you don't do that very much. Uh, or, you know, creating VPCs. There's a bunch of things that can sort of happen that you would want to respond to. And I'll show you a couple of tools that, that deal with that as well. So, like, let's say you had one of these key compromises. One of your keys got out there. And I'm telling you right now, if you get access keys committed to GitHub, it's on the order of minutes before a bad guy finds it and tries it. And, and we've seen people run experiments where they, you know, like release, release a key and just kind of time it to see, you know, how, how soon somebody tries it. And it's, it's shocking. I'm not encouraging you to go do that. Take my word. It, it happens and it happens fast. So let's say you're trying to deal with that. Well, there's this fabulous thing from uh, the threat response guys, AWS IR. And you can just basically say, hey, key compromise, here's my key ID. And they will go revoke all the sessions related to that key ID, gather whatever evidence they have, chuck it in an S3 bucket. Super fast, super simple. And now you don't have to know. Or rather, you don't have to know all the commands that were run. They've automated it. You do need to know. And let me talk about how a couple of customers do this. Because um, we have a few customers, um, like the, the guys at Alfresco, they wrote this great tool called Prowler, which is, is actually a bit long in the tooth. There's a bunch of new things uh, that might even do a better job. But it's one of these things where you can just go um, fire off Prowler and just have it just roam around your AWS account, poking into all the regions, poking into all the VPCs, poking into all the different resources, and looking for a bunch of problems with the CIS benchmarks. Now, CIS benchmarks are one of these things where we have probably given you about 50 different ways to check your stuff against the CIS benchmarks. This is one of them. There's some config rules out there if you use AWS config. There's um, some scripts that'll do it. There's Linux hardened builds that are built against the CIS standards. There's a bunch of those. And then Mozilla, um, you know, thanks, Simon. Uh, those guys have, have helped with this threat response IR toolkit. And I'm going to show you what that looks like um, if I could just pop over to GitHub fast enough. Fast is not part of this computer's vocabulary. 
Let's tell you what. Let's not do that too quickly. Oh, come on. Are you kidding me? Tell you what. Let's just not bother. Oh, come on. You know how hard this is to do when you can't see your screen? Forget the GitHub thing. Um, I'm not going to go to the web browser. But if you just go to GitHub and you look up AWS underscore IR. Um, no, really, man. I did click that button. If you go to AWS IR, you'll see that they've got a fabulous command that will, in fact, run. You can say, here's my instance ID. And given the instance ID, it will go off and isolate the instance, just like I showed you. It will install Lime, which is a Linux memory extractor, which is a kernel module that will give you access to all of RAM. Now, the fabulous tool called Margarita Shotgun. Have you guys seen Margarita Shotgun? So I love it when a tool has a great story for its name. And Margarita Shotgun uses Lime, right? The Linux memory extractor. And what's it going to do? It's going to blast Lime across your cloud. <laughs> Margarita Shotgun, right? <laughs> Blasting Limes across our cloud. So I love the, the name for it. And then it will extract all the RAM. It'll stick it in a S3 bucket and, and you know, assign tagging everything with some incident identifier. So that's a fabulous little tool. Uh, and I would urge you to go look it up because then you don't have to write the scripts that I, I thought you might have to write. Right, they've already done it for you. So fundamentally, if you are responding to incidents, the most important thing to do is automate. <clears throat> I was speaking to Steve Schmidt, who is our CISO, so our CISO at AWS. And I said, Steve, there's a real problem with alert fatigue generally, right? Alert fatigue just, just causes people all kinds of difficulties. You just get used to saying, yeah, yeah, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. And then an important alert comes up and you don't even see it. Yeah, sure, whatever. And I said, Steve, what do we do to avoid alert fatigue? What does AWS do to avoid alert fatigue on our security team who must be dealing with just untold numbers of incidents? And his answer was automate. Anything that we see a lot, we're going to write an automation to deal with it. And then the weird stuff that the automation can't deal with, that's going to bubble up to a human. So if it's coming up to a human and a human is dealing with it, it's probably not something we see very much, probably does need a human to deal with it. And then if that human starts to see this a few times, we're probably going to go write a script or write some program that's going to automatically resolve most of those things. So we only see the weird stuff. If it's in the service domain, you've got to learn the native APIs. So you've got to respond that way. And leverage the open source tools. There's a ton of stuff out there. The guys at Capital One have Cloud Custodian. We've got a lot of people using that. There's a lot of open source tools out there. So that, in my pajamas, is how we do incident response in our pajamas. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Paco. So um, uh, before we get to the Q&A from the audience, there are a couple of questions um, on the uh, slide.do app. If you want to ask questions, don't forget to go to slide.do and type hash or wasp. Uh, right, most popular question in the world, can we get a copy of the slides? Yes, all the slides from all OWASP events going back years and years and years are available on our webpage. So just Google for OWASP London, you can download all the slides and video recordings of talks on our YouTube channel. Right, so here's a question for Paco. Do you believe cloud security is robust enough to use instead of full on-prem business backups disconnected from network once completed? Um, I mean, do I think it's good enough? Of course I do, because I mean, it's what we do. Um, so I mean, the, the short answer, the, the real interesting question is probably not, is it secure enough? But how can I do it securely enough that I will trust that instead of trusting my old disconnected backups? And that's kind of a longer conversation. But yeah, I mean, you know, we have these things like Glacier, which has the super durability and, and is you know, kind of almost offline in the sense that it's you know, far away and archived. We have a lot of these services. Uh, I could, you know, whoever it is, you want to come up to me later, yeah, we'll absolutely sit down and talk about it. But do I believe it's robust enough? Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question, what is the most difficult change of thinking issue you found with support teams moving to cloud? 
Oh, that's a fabulous question. What is the most difficult uh, change in the mode of thinking? There are a lot of people who do security, and their job in security is to click the button. When that thing turns red, I click this here button. And like, we're going to go get a robot to do that? But you, person who have sat here and dealt with so many incidents, you know the things that go bump in the night. You understand how this business works. You know why it's important that when that thing turns red, you click this button. So we want people who... Uh, the, People will feel threatened that automation is going to take their security job, and it so totally isn't. We're just taking the tedious bits that you know how to do, we'll automate those so we can use your brains and your experience and your knowledge of the business to go take the business farther. And so I think people are giving up some comfort zone, doing some, some tasks that are you know, comfortable and easy, been doing it for a while, and that, that probably worries some people. That's the, the change in thinking, too. I don't have to do it myself anymore. I got robots to do that for me. But what needs to be done? And that's the hard human part. Excellent. Um, another interesting question. Um, can you limit CPU and RAM consumption of instance in the quarantine? Uh, I sense probably there's a billing pretext in there as well. <laughs> um, well, you know, actually, I mean, instances are instances. I mean, the T2s, you can sort of run out of CPU credits, but generally an instance is billed for the instance hours it's running, whether the CPU is at 100% utilization or zero. So the, the need to limit from a billing perspective would be um, minimal. Um, and from a RAM consumption, again, RAM, you don't really, there's, there's no, so I'm not sure what the underlying issue is there. We do have this new hibernate mode. You can like stop a, an instance and it can hibernate, but that's only supported on a few instance classes. So I would have to, I'd have to know what you're really trying to do with that, because I don't see an obvious reason why you would do that. OK, thanks. Um, okay. I think we're going to take a couple of questions from the audience. Throwable mic. Uh, hi there. Is the um, forensic tool or forensic capability, is that bespoke to AWS? Has AWS created it? Or is that something like a, an external, well-known tool that you've built in? like? I don't know, end case or something like that. Well, the AWS IR tool that I was talking about is supported actually both by Microsoft and by Amazon. So I'm sure they must have some, some Microsoft-capable similar properties. I haven't used it that way, so I don't know. Um, but then the property of being able to like slap a security group around an instance to block network traffic, and you know, obviously that's an AWS native capability, and other providers will have something similar. Um, but I don't know the, the APIs for those. Uh, the, the approach you just described about automotive, automotive response to, to incidents, uh, it's quite nice, and I believe that it will save your time and your effort. But don't you think that with all automotive response uh, uh, and automotive tools, you're just introducing new level of vulnerability? Because what I just need to do, I just need to trigger the incident, and until you sleep, I need to get access to the memory dump in S3 bucket. I believe that you'll protect that, but you know, protection of the three buckets where you're saving your memory and protection of pr production system may be different. Uh, well, sure. I mean, I see what you're getting at. Like, there's this new sort of uh, risk exposure, this new sort of attack surface. If I have lots of RAM dumps being chucked into S3 buckets, and, and you think, well, gosh, you know, that RAM dump could have some sensitive data in it, so, but now it's out in an S3 bucket. I mean, yeah, I do see that it is extra attack surface. You have to. Um, you have to secure for sure. Do I think that's an extra vulnerability, or is that is that risk worse than the capability that it gives you? You know, I, I think the business benefit is higher than the than the residual risk you're taking on there. That's just yeah, you know, it's just an opinion. Oh, it's gonna be a hard one. <laughs> hey, Dennis. So, hey, Aaron. Um, so, how are you automating the the huge amount of data? and information that you created during an incident from a point of view of the people involved in that and also the upper levels of management. How are you automating, I'm sorry, the... Uh, the, the amount of data and information that gets created during an incident, including automated tasks, right? Is yeah, I mean, that's a really important thing, right? Once you start operating your security in the cloud this way, you've got a lot of code, you have a lot of data. Like, it's not very long before you start down this path and you realize, man, we better stand up a data warehouse or something to start dealing with all the security data that we get. So if you're asking how you manage that, yeah, you suddenly start learning you know, big data. But you also mentioned getting it up to management. 
And one of the big culture shifts in, in automating your security is just that. Like a lot of security people don't have developer skills. And so, you know, like writing security as code, deploying that code through a pipeline, getting the business to say what it needs to happen in a way that you could then turn that to a user story and then you could implement that as code. Those are, that's, that's the new thing that we have to do with them. They're used to having security be a bunch of PDFs that nobody reads. And they, we now need security to be deployed much more like software. What should it do? And so that's the trade. That's a, another shift, getting the executives to start talking about security features like their like their business features. And the of the playbooks. Right. 